point, I'm going to hand things over to our DFP core faculty member, Dr. Nazan Virgi Bevel. Great, thanks, Jocelyn. Uh, it is my real pleasure to introduce Dr. Shauna Pandya. I heard Shauna speak at a conference uh, last summer where we were at a conference about Canada going to the moon and I was just blown away by her talk and I did everything I could to get her here today. So I'm really excited and give her a really warm welcome. Shauna did her uh, undergrad degree in neuroscience at the University of Alberta and went on to do her degree in medicine also at the University of Alberta. She has an incredibly long list of accomplishments and it would take the entire session for me to talk about all of them, but I'm gonna give you a few highlights. So she of course is a physician, but she's also a scientist astronaut candidate with Project Possum. She's an aquanaut. She's also an advanced diver and a skydiver and a pilot in training. She's the VP of immersive medicine with Luxonic Technologies. Director of Medical Research at Orbital Assembly Construction. She's also um, serves as a medical advisor to several space medical and technology companies. And she was part of the first crew to test a commercial space blue, uh, spacesuit in zero gravity. She has earned her aquanaut designation uh, during the 2019 Neptune mission. She also served as a commander during a 2020 tour at the Mars Desert Research Station. In 2021, she was granted an honorary fellowship in extreme and wilderness medicine by the World Extreme Medicine Organization and has been named as one of the Women's Executive Network's top 100 most powerful women in Canada, as well as a Canadian Space Agency Space Ambassador. Wow, we're really looking forward to your talk, Shauna, and uh, please go ahead. Perfect. First of all, can I just get a quick thumbs up? Everyone can see and hear me okay and see my slides okay? All right, so away we go, 45 minutes and 110 slides and a heck of a lot of caffeine. So we're about to take you on a whirlwind ride through the world of space medicine and upcoming design challenges for the moon, Mars and beyond. So you've heard a little bit about my background, physician, scientist, astronaut, candidate, program graduate, um, aquanaut, explorer, skydiver, pilot in training, so much more, have a lot of affiliations um, with a lot of space things. Um, but let's get to it. So let's start with a question um, before um, we get into the meat of what we want to discuss today. And before we do that, I want to take you through some of the learning objectives of what I hope you'll get out of this talk. And basically, I want you to have to have a sense of what the hazards of the space flight environment include, the tools available to help us mitigate these risks, design challenges specific to the space flight environment, the value of analog environments for testing on Earth, the value of emerging technologies for upcoming challenges, um, and the next generation challenges that we have to think about. So let's get to that initial question. Imagine you are the crew doctor for a mission to the moon today. What will you pack with you? Well, in order to tone to know what you are packing for, it helps to understand what our priorities are. And so everyone has seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the survival pyramid, starting with food, shelter, sleep. But I would argue this being 2021, Wi-Fi is probably at the base of that pyramid. More seriously though, if we need to, if we want to know what we are packing for and how we're going to pack, it helps to start with acknowledging the hazards of the space flight environment. So here is a whole long laundry list of everything we can encounter in space that would pose a threat to our health. Um, that includes increased radiation, which we'll talk about further, and the acceleration deceleration loads associated with launch, altered day-night cycles. So when you're on the International Space Station, um, 450 kilometers above the Earth's surface, you're rotating at a rate of 90 minutes to complete one revolution around the Earth. So that's one sunset, one sunset, sunrise, sunset cycle every 90 minutes. That means 16 sunrise sunset cycles per 24 hours. Uh, you're dealing in confined spaces, so crew dynamics become really important. No one wants to be that guy or gal who's voted off the space habitat. When you're going on a spacewalk, there's additional challenges. You have to concentrate. You're confined in the space for a long time. You risk decompression sickness if you, you um, because of the pressure differential between your spacesuit and the spacecraft. Um, and then there's everyday challenges, like the lumps and bumps that you would expect to um, get on Earth. Um, there's uh, 
a whole lot more challenges, but let's talk about the big one that everyone thinks about when they talk about space. And that's of course, microgravity or what's colloquially known as zero G. So the bottom line is that every single bodily system is affected in microgravity, whether we're talking about decreased bone density loss. So when you're in space, your bones, because they're offloaded, they're not even weighed down by grab the one G luxury that every single one of us attending this lecture has, tend to lose mass at a rate of 1.5% per month. And that doesn't level off, that, um, that continues to decline. So as you can imagine, without countermeasures, you'll soon reflect an osteoporotic state on Earth. Your muscles lose mass from that same mechanism of not being loaded. Your fluids shift upwards. And let's talk a little bit about, more about that. Anna, so, can I again, interrupt you? Yes. Sorry for one second. Yes. There's a black box on your screen. I think it's from, you might have another oh, sure. window open. Oh, no, that's the that's Zoom. But thank you for letting me know. Let me change the control configuration. Perfect. That's better. Yeah. Thank you. So one second. Yeah, it's gone now. Yeah, sorry, that was the Zoom video panel. Just wanted to make sure I could see any visual cues, but no worries. Thanks for letting me know about that. That gray box that you see now is, should also disappear in a few seconds. All right, so when we talk about fluid shift, every single one of us has the luxury of being here in 1G today. So that means that blood automatically pools in our feet. What happens when we take away that 1G stimulus? So then fluid automatically shifts upwards, which has a whole bunch of repercussions for every single bodily system. So in the cardiovascular system, our hearts are perceiving an increased fluid load. Astronauts are starting to pee out more in those first few days on station, reflecting a um, osteoporotic, uh, sorry, a dehydrated state in um, microgravity. The kidneys, uh, because of this fluid shift, are more prone to making kidney stones. And then you get the very aptly named moon face. So you can see um, astro Japanese astronaut, Dr. Chaki Mukai. You can see her image, uh, her face, what it looks like on Earth. And then on the right, you can see how puffy um, her face becomes from having all of that increased fluid shift upwards. So forget plasmapheresis, forget collagen injections. Um, you can simply look more useful by going up to space. Um, the other consequence of this is several folds. So now because you have all this fluid in your face, you're constantly congested as if you have a as if you had a cold. So then the the nutrition that you're intaking um, needs to be more flavorful, more textured, more flavored, more textured, more savory, more spicy to overcome um, this, this banality introduced by the congestion. When you come back to earth, um, you are suddenly decompensated because now blood is pulling back down and these valves in your veins have gone on strike. They've been lazy while they had nothing to do in space. And so when you see astronauts being carried out um, from a Soyuz landing capsule, once they land on earth, they receive this hero's welcome. Part of it's pomp and circumstance, but part of it is, these astronauts would look pretty bad if they fainted immediately upon trying to stand up because they can't. Um, the other consequence, which is a relatively newly described phenomenon um, a, over the past uh, 12 to 15 years is what we call the space adaptation neuroocular syndrome or SANS for short. So cerebrospinal fluid is this juice that describes or that bathes our spines and our brains and our central nervous system. And what we know when this fluid shifts upwards and there's impre, uh, impaired drainage, impaired lymphatic, impa impaired venous drainage is that um, this tends to increase the pressure in our in our brains, particularly around the optic nerves, those nerves that exit the back of our retinas and the back of our eye. And so there tends to be increased pressure. And you can see that in this images, these images here, um, you can see that pale dot at the back of the retina. That's a, an optic nerve experiencing increased pressure or edema. Um, and so this actually has altered vision in male astronauts in particular. Speaking of gender differences, we know that there are a few gender differences when it comes to male and female astronauts from what's been described so far. So males are more prone to developing this neuroocular syndrome. Um, females, because of their shorter urethra, are more prone to um, uh, experiencing bladder infections, urinary tract infections. Um, females are more prone to experiencing changes re related to orthostatic hypotension, fainting once they get back on Earth. Males are more prone to um, experienced uh, cardiovascular changes in flight. Overall, we know that men and women perform the same when it comes to cognition, behavior, and psychology. Um, 
And the data keeps coming despite decades of data from human spaceflight. So this is a famous NASA twins study published in around 2017 in Science. And this was a very comprehensive interdisciplinary collaborative study that looked at everything from our gut microbiomes to cognition to the molecular level and DNA RNA methylation. And there were some surprises. So telomeres, which are associated with aging and shortening as we age, were found to lengthen um, in space. Um, diet, uh, the gut microbiome was found to be totally different as to what it would be on Earth, but then that could be due to the diet um, that, uh, that astronauts have on station because this, the gut microbiome restored itself once uh, Commander Scott Kelly came back to Earth. Um, so this is an ongoing field of research, and we'll talk about why that's important. So one of the latest findings, this is in 2019, um, on a routine handheld ultrasound experiment where an astronauts were ultrasounding the, their jugular veins on station, lo and behold, they found out suddenly that one of the astronauts had developed a giant clot in their external jugular veins. So now we have to ask the question, well, is being in microgravity, is being in space a hypercoagulable state? Are you more prone to developing clots in space? And if so, what does that mean for long duration um, missions? So this is a whole whack load. This is a crash course in space medicine and space physiology. And if you take nothing away from this section, it's simply that space is trying to kill you. And that's just what we know from decades of research in low Earth orbit. And so the that begs the question, well, what happens when we go beyond low Earth orbit? And this isn't simply a theoretical question. This is a very real um, and valid question because of the roadmap that NASA and the international community has when it comes to human space exploration. So um, starting with the moon, NASA has plans to go forward to the moon, starting with a lunar gateway, commencing construction in 2022, hoping to have the first um, crew on this um, space station around the moon with a directorate for um, Earth observation, science, astronomy, sun observation, moon observation, and also serving as a waypoint um, to the moon itself. Um, starting in 2024, NASA has pledged the Artemis mission as early as 2024 to send the first woman and next man to the moon and establish permanent surface operations for science and exploration. Um, as early as 2024 and then permanent surface operations by the end of the decade. And then the other value of going forward to the moon is to serve as a test bed for the next generation, the next destination, which is Mars. And so the reason that we would use the moon as a test bed is because the moon is a simple five day hop, skip and a step away, while as Mars is a six to nine month journey, depending on the alignment of the two planets away. And it's not just the international community, the private commercial space sector as well has plans to go to Mars. Elon Musk very famously at a very um, major space conference in 2016 said he's going to send humans to Mars by the 2030s and not to be outdone. Boeing said, well, we will beat SpaceX there. So perhaps it's the next new space race. So we asked the question, well, what happens when we go beyond low Earth orbit? Let's talk about challenges specific to going beyond and going further than we have before. So there's the challenges of, of uh, specific environments. So on the moon, we have one sixth gravity. On the Mars, on, on Mars, we have 0.38 gravity, what we'd experience on Earth. We know from the Apollo missions that um, lunar dust was a major hazard to skin. It was an irritant to the respiratory system. It clogged up um, uh, the joints of the spacesuit. So for anyone who ever said that the moon landing isn't real, well, they went through a lot of effort to fake those thousands of pages of documentation um, documenting the concerns with lunar dust. We briefly touched upon radiation. And all you need to know about radiation is the further you go, the more we have to contend with. So even at the level of the International Space Station, we're still relatively protected by being within um, Earth's Van Allen belt. So the high energy that we see from galactic cosmic radiation, as well as uh, solar particle flares, solar particle events, is filtered out by these Van Allen belts in the Earth's magnetosphere. Um, so even, but even when you're on the International Space Station, in one day, you're receiving 250 times the radiation that you would see on Earth. And then as you go beyond the protective confines of the Van Allen belts, you're actually 
now exposed to 700 fold as well as higher energy radiation, which becomes a concern when we talk about acute chronic radiation sickness, as well as the risk of cancer to various organs. Then there's, of course, the time delay. So even traveling at the speed of light across these, uh, all of these distances, the further out you go, the more of a time delay there is. So on the International Space Station, the time delay is relatively negligible. By the time you get to the moon, it's a 2.4 second um, uh, round trip uh, time delay. And then by the time you get to Mars, depending on the alignment of Earth and Mars, it's about a six to 46 minute time delay. So now imagine you have a major emergency, a medical trauma on Mars. You don't have 46 minutes to wait for help from mission control on Earth um, to help you solve that problem. So the challenges of exploration class missions to the moon, Mars and beyond can be summarized as what we call the big five, altered gravity environments, distance from Earth, radiation, isolation, confinement, and everything else which falls under hostile environments, whether we're talking about the threat of um, increased dust or trauma on a, on a moonwalk or um, altered uh, day-night cycles. So that would be 14 days of day, 14 day, uh, nights of night on a lunar day-night cycle. So let's take a pause. Let's bring it back to our initial question. Um, now that I've adequately stressed you out about the hazards that await you. You are the crew doctor, what you pack now. So we've talked about the things that can kill you. Now let's talk about how we can prepare ourselves and the tools that we have at our disposal. So the number one tool is prevention. If you can start at selection by selecting the healthiest and those who are unlikeliest to run into medical trouble, you're already one step ahead of the game. So for example, I like to say that the hopes and the, the path to becoming an astronaut is littered with the hopes and dreams of medically disqualified candidates, whether they've been disqualified for having kidney stones, having previous disc herniations in their back, previous broken bones. All of these are criteria for medical disqualification. Um, the other part of that is risk mitigation. So if anyone's an engineer in the, uh, in the audience, you'll recognize this as a risk matrix, and this is the NASA risk matrix. So basically, how do they decide what needs to be mitigated? So they look at the consequence versus the likelihood of something happening. If something is high probability to occur and highly um, deleterious to the mission, if it does happen, it absolutely needs to be mitigated. Otherwise, an, otherwise it's an unacceptable risk. If something is low likelihood, but high, a high consequence, you probably don't need to worry about it. So think about a C-section in space. Yeah, that would be terrifying to perform, but odds are you'll have screened out against sending pregnant astronauts, particularly in the third trimester to space. If something's low likelihood, low consequence, you don't worry about it. The other tools you have are monitoring, countermeasures. Uh, and so, and this also starts with pre-flight, in-flight, post-flight rehab and, and monitoring. So for example, we talked about bone and um, muscle mass loss and density loss. And so for example, one of the countermeasures used on the International Space Station in zero G is that the astronauts have to perform one and a half to two hours of resistive and aerobic exercise six days of the week. It continues with nutrition, pre-flight quarantine, um, crew medical officer training. So on the International Space Station, um, crew um, medical officers have 40 hours of training. And there's also an onboard medical kit with medi appropriate medications, procedures, and protocols, which we'll talk about in a few slides. Um, there's also a very collaborative, multidisciplinary disciplinary approach when it comes to the flight surgeon, pre-flight um, team that includes nutritionists, flight surgeons, aerospace specialists, occupational health um, specialists, uh, psychologists. Um, so we're trying to really develop this comprehensive picture of both preventative care as well as in-flight care. There's computer modeling tools at our disposal. So this is a snapshot of the NASA um, Exploration Medical Capability, IMM, or Integrated Medical Model. Um, so basically, this helps extrapolate what volume and what quantity and what, what uh, medical um, kit and um, uh, equipment that you'll bring with you on a mission. And basically, you input the number of people on your crew and the duration of your mission, as well as your acceptable um, limits for loss of crew life and loss of mission. Um, and then you input that and extrapolate data from previous ISS medical kits, and that helps you generate your medical kit for a new mission profile um, based on extrapolation. And there's probably some of you in the audience are saying, well, wait, what happens if you have on your 
um, medical on your mission, you have four different events occur. You have a trauma, a kidney stone, a bladder infection, as well as a foreign body in the eye all occur. Well, then you're not really accounting for the dynamic effect of depleting your medical kit. So that's a great question. NASA's addressed this too through something called the Medical Extensible Dynamic Probability Risk Assessment Tool. It's called the MedPrep because that's far easier to say. And this is based on Bayesian model modeling and neural networks and allows um, mission planners to account for multiple medical events at different times during the medical, uh, during the mission to generate different possible outcomes. So imagine getting a uh, broken arm on day two of the mission when you've just left Earth's orbit en route to Mars. That's a wholly different outcome for a mission versus having a broken arm on landing at the end of the mission. So it allows for more dynamic modeling. The other thing to know about preparing for space is what you're planning for. So here's a snapshot of the Exploration Medical Capabilities Top 100 list of things that can happen in space based on data from previ previous space life. So everything from the terrifying cardiac arrest, major trauma, major bleed, to um, something that's banal and everyday, like congestion and a headache, to something that's banal and everyday, but equally terrifying, like diarrhea in space. The next part of the puzzle is knowing your packing constraints. So NASA likens this to the backpacking principle. So think of if you're a hiker. Um, everything that you bring with you on a hiking expedition is at the expense of something else because you're limited on what you can fit and how much you can carry in your backpack. I like to call this the Aladdin principle of packing for space because it takes phenomenal cosmic power to get someone to the moon or Mars, itty bitty living space. So how do you pack for that? It can best be summarized as needing to take equipment that is low cost, low volume, low mass, low power, easy to use, and also resistant against the environment, the high radiation environment. And so here's a snapshot of the NASA medical kits uh, on the International Space Station. So they're very highly modularized, very tightly packed, very compact. And then each kit is dedicated to equipment versus procedural things versus medication. Um, now here's where things need to evolve. So here's the NASA Human Research Roadmap. Here's a snapshot of all of the risks we can encounter on exploration class missions, including radiation, dust, crew interactions, loss of skills over the course of a long duration mission. So my takeaway for you from this section is that space is hard, space is extensive, and space is trying to kill us. So how do we prepare for that before we even get to space? Well, here's a question for you. What do the International Space Station, a remote village in India or Kenya, a polar deployment to the Arctic or Antarctica, and the Aquarius Reef Base, an underwater research laboratory, have in common? All of these are examples of extreme and what we like to call analog environments because they're in some way analogous to the spaceflight environment, whether they reflect the um, isolation and confinement or the resource limitedness of, the, of the, uh, being in space. So what can we learn from these analog environments? I'm gonna take you in this next session, section through some of my experiences in altered gravity or in an analog environment, starting with altered gravity environments. Um, so this is an example of uh, my, simulating microgravity on earth. This is a, uh, the parabolic flight, um, what some of you may know as the vomit comet. So you're simulating periods of 20 to 30 seconds of microgravity at a time. So how do you do that? Um, you're actually flying lower than a transatlantic flight. We fly out of the uh, National Research Council in Ottawa, Canada um, at 17 to 19,000 feet. A transatlantic flight fly at about 39,000 feet and you're flying in a parabola. So think as if you're going up a roller coaster and just for that split second, when you reach the crest of the roller coaster, you're actually weightless for a second. You can feel your heart kind of, your stomach lift up into your heart. And so when you're falling at the same rate as an airplane, you're actually um, simulating microgravity, being weightless um, for 20 to 30 seconds. And here's a snapshot, a quick um, few seconds of what that looks like. So hopefully this will play. Um, Anna, you have yeah. the black box again on your screen. So just wanted you to take that off before you play that. Is that in the, the upper right hand corner? It's right in the center of the screen. Okay, it should go away in a second here. Are you able to see this video? It should come through in the next five seconds.
Are you seeing that video? the video but the black box that's going across on the top is still there but we can see the video allows us to do so you can see that in these periods of microgravity that you're allowed to actually able to test the capabilities of this spacesuit while it's pressurized while the visors down you're able to test the fine motor movement that you're able to perform while the suit is pressurized um but those are those are also a very limited period of time and they may be expensive so how else can we simulate altered gravity so here's some eva or extravehicular activity spacesuit testing the kind of space that you'll see on spacewalks um, and the kind of spacesuits um, that you'll see on the Apollo missions. Um, so we're testing the spacesuit with the Canadian Space Agency in a gravity offset harness. And so um, what you're doing is you're offlifting, offloading a certain amount of your weight, whether it's 87% of your, or sorry, 83% of your weight to simulate lunar gravity or all your weight, in which is a scenario here. So we're simulating um, myself doing a spacewalk, fixing a panel outside of the International Space Station by virtue of this um, harness. Um, and it's not just microgravity and partial gravity that we need to simulate. So here is the uh, snapshot from centrifuge training. Um, so centrifuge allows us to simulate hypergravity profiles because when you're launching, you're actually experiencing um, several Gs. And so in this particular test, we were uh, experiencing flight profiles you would see on a commercial suborbital flight like Virgin or uh, Blue Origin. And so you're actually experiencing up to six um, G loads on your chest in the front to back direction, which actually turns out to be, as I found out, quite hard to breathe through. Um, what other types of analog environments are there? So let's talk about water analogs. What is the value of that? So here's a snapshot from our IVA, intravehicular activity spacesuit testing in landing operations. So in this particular scenario, we're simulating that capsule behind me. It's an Orion capsule landing in the ocean and then suddenly there's a crew emergency and you have to egress in an emergent fashion from that capsule. How does the spacesuit interact with the water? Um, I can tell you from personal experience, it's super critical to pull all the seals on your spacesuit um, a very tightly, very quickly. Otherwise you have to swim with a suit full of water and climb up a ladder with a suit full of ladder, which is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Other examples of analog water analog environments. So here is the 2019 Neptune Aquanaut mission that I took part in. As you're quickly learning, the space and exploration worlds are full of acronyms. So Neptune stands for Nautical Experiments in Physiology, Technology, Under and Underwater um, Exploration. And so on this five-day mission, we lived and researched uh, underwater, con conducting psychological science um, experiments as well as technology um, uh, tests. And so we were living in this, this dive saturation complex, 20 feet uh, under uh, water. If we wanted to go out, we had to suit up uh, in our dive gear. We had to dive our equipment in and dive our equipment out. And it's really a lesson in isolation, confinement, and crew dynamics, as well as um, figuring out what technologies can help you survive and thrive in these environments. So I'll talk a little bit more about this testing in the, the last part of this talk. Um, just 13 miles horizontally down from the Jules Undersea Lodge where we did the Neptune mission is the Aquarius Reef Base. So this is where NASA runs its NEMO missions, NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations Environment. Even though it's only 13 miles from Jules Undersea Lodge, they're both in the Florida Keys, it's at 50 feet underwater. So what that means is once you're underwater and breathing the same pressure as the ambient air around you, all those nitrogen bubbles in your blood go into saturation and you have to decompress at a set rate, otherwise those bubbles come out um, of saturation and can lodge in bad places like your heart, lungs, and brain um, and cause bad things like seizures, coma, and death. 
Um, so it really is a lesson in isolation and confinement. And my favorite fact about evacuation from the Aquarius free phase is that it takes 15 hours and 47 minutes to properly decompress and safely leave towards the surface. By comparison, from the moment that you hit the evacuation button on the International Space Station, you can be down on Earth in definitive medical care in Kazakhstan in as little as three and a half hours. So you can get to definitive medical care from the International Space Station more quickly from the ISS than you can from the Aquarius Free Phase. So let's talk about the value of isolated and confined environments. So here is a snapshot from the Mars Desert Research Station, real life on fake Mars. Um, so we, this is where I served as crew medical officer and then later as a commander, you're living with your crew um, is if you were living on Mars. So you have to suit up if you wanna go outside, otherwise the environment would kill you. You're performing these EVAs to do lunar um, and geol or sorry, Martian exploration, geology experiments, and you're also learning to live um, as a group, good crewmate. Similarly, operational environments. So here's a snapshot from a research campaign I did in 2017. We're an unpressurized research aircraft. Um, that's why we have the oxygen masks on. We're trying to test this new, uh, this new tomography instrument to get a further idea of a brand new type of cloud of the three-dimensional structure. Um, and you're really learning about what it takes to work as a coordinated team in a very tight, envi confined environment. And the crew dynamics really becomes critical there. And then of course, resource limited environments. You don't have to be at the bottom of the ocean. You don't have to be in zero G to replicate the um, uh, value of an analog environment. So this is a snapshot from the operational space medicine course I run with Possum and AAAS. And basically we're teaching our non-medically trained participants to become a medical space MacGyver. And throughout the course of this, um, uh, course, we take them through increasingly complex trauma situations from simple trauma, poly trauma, mass casualty and night scenarios, and they all do amazingly. So in this last part um, of the talk, I want to talk about the future. So we've laid out the challenges of the uh, of the spaceflight environment very well. So let's ask a what if question. What is the gold standard um, for giving care on Mars? And the answer, if there were no constraints, would simply to be to bring another Earth with us. Then that way we have atmosphere, we don't have to deal with altered gravity, we filter out the radiation, we're not confined, but we have constraints. So then how do we overcome that? Well, what if we ask a different question? What if we didn't just provide the standard of care of healthcare on Mars as we did on Earth, but what if we surpassed it? So how do we do that? To, say, to do that, my suggestion is to look at examples from science fiction. So what if we could mitigate the hazards of zero G by having partial gravity, um, by having a rotating space station? What if we could help decompensated astronauts perform meaningful work on the surface of Mars by having exoskeleton? What if we could mitigate skills deterioration by simply uploading skills to our brain like in the matrix? What if we could get over all of the challenges of radiation and microgravity by simply teleporting to Mars? Or what if we just said, that's too hard, that's too much effort, let's just send avatars to Mars. Well, the future is closer than you think. So we talked about uploading our skills to the, the our brains like the matrix. Well, I'm working on something with one of the companies I work with called Luxonic through VR to help mitigate the loss of medical skills through the course of a long duration mission by having crew medical officers and astronauts practice these skills, medical skills, whether it's injection, intubation in, in uh, VR so that they're not uh, losing these skills. So imagine you're the crew medical officer and the first time that you practice a putting in an IV um, since you learned the skill on Earth was nine months later on Mars. Your poor patient will look like a pin cushion. So that's the value of practicing these skills in VR. Um, where else can we look to? Let's talk about genetic engineering. This is a snapshot from one of my favorite articles in the MIT Review from 2017. And in it, they talk about splicing in DNA from elephants um, to not, not to make the elephant man, but because elephants don't get cancer. Why is that? It's because elephants have four copies of the P57 onco-editing gene. Humans have two. So if we, they make the argument saying if we're willingly sending humans into a high radiation environment where we know they're going to face hazards, don't we have a moral authority to help prepare them against the hazards of that environment? And this isn't as far off as you think. Here's a snapshot from the September 
2020, 20, uh, rodent research 19 experiment that NASA sent to space in collaboration with a lot of other neuromuscular and bone researchers. And basically they sent these uh, genetically augmented jacked up little mice, that you, this is muscular mouse that you see on the left here. And then um, they compared them to non-genetically engineered mice. They had flown and non-flown groups. And then they also introduced an intervention called the ACBR2 receptor blockade, helping prevent muscle and bone breakdown. And so what they found was that in these genetically engineered mice who were flown, they actually tended to lose less bone and less muscle mass than their non-genetically engineered counterparts. And so NASA is literally engineering Mighty Mouse. And the technology innovations don't stop there. So um, we're also we're borrowing from um, science fiction. Uh, here we have images of TARS from Interstellar and HAL from my Space Odyssey 2001. What if we could apply principles of AI and machine learning to help with di diagnostics? Um, so remember, as physicians, our job isn't to know it all. We cannot possibly, with the rate at which new guidelines are coming out, and imagine that the crew physician is the one that's incapacitated on Mars. Having an AI um, diagnostic tool on the surface of Mars would help uh, make better healthcare treatment and diagnostic decisions. Again, we talked about being resource limited. So what if you could print your medical tools with you? Um, so 3D printing in situ, it's not simply a far off concept. Made in Space is the first company to have 3D printed in space on the International Space Station. And elsewhere in the world, borrowing from the world of science fiction, you heard that I'm part of a company called Orbital Assembly Corporation. We are literally engineering the world's first rotating partial gravity space station to help mitigate all of those deleterious effects that one might expe uh, expect to encounter in microgravity, whether it's bone and muscle loss to the space adaptation neuroocular syndrome. So what about looking really far into the future? What about human hibernation? So ESA, the European Space Agency, actually ran a study looking at um, how much volume and mass and supplies that we could save if we had humans hibernate for the duration of a six to nine month journey to Mars and waking up, up only three weeks before landing on the surface. And they found that they could actually save about one third of the volume of a spacecraft, which is huge in terms of cost, in terms of fuel, in terms of uh, life support systems, um, if they were able to put humans in hibernation. And there's actually very real biology institutes that are looking at introducing hibernation in species like rats. So ground squirrels hibernate, they reduce their metabolism to the 1% um, of what it is when they're awake. So they're trying to look at non-hibernating species and seeing if um, they can introduce that hibernation to save on all of these resources. And so far they've been able to with the pesky side effect of having increased gut ischemia, perforation, sepsis, and death. So a little bit of things to be sorted out still. Um, and what if we just said, well, Six to nine months, who wants to do that? That's way too long. Well, someone's working on that too. Frank Cheng Diaz, the former NASA astronaut has introduced a concept for the Vasmir plasma in engine that could get to Mars in 90, 39 days. So what I'm getting at with all of these examples of technology is to be able to survive and thrive in space, we're going to have to science the space out of this with a little of space MacGyvering too. So in the last five minutes here, I want to talk to you about what's next on the horizon of questions that we have to answer when it comes to successfully surviving on thrive and thriving on the moon, Mars, and beyond. So what's next in space medicine? We still have to delineate that gravity prescription. How much gravity for what duration at what points is enough to prevent all of those hazards that we talked about? How do the crew selection requirements for Mars need to change? We know that there's data a lot around resilience. Uh, especially in confined, isolated, austere environments. So how do we need to select the perfect crew for Mars and what analogs do we look at? And just how self-sufficient do they need to be? So this is a picture of uh, Leonid, uh, Leonid Rogozov, Soviet physician, 1961, successfully diagnosed his own appendicitis. He was the crew physician. He was the only one who could do this. So there, he fixed it. He did his own auto appendectomy. So, what happens if that happens in space? So here's a paper looking at the value of prophylactic surgery and appendectomies before going to Mars so you don't run into that exact situation. And there is precedent for this on Earth. There's a Chilean sediment, settlement in Antarctica called Via Las Estrellas, where anyone over the age of six has to have their appendix removed because they're so far from definitive care. So it's not so far out there. 
When we talk about radiation, what is the safest way to engineer and have a habitat? There are some who suggest that only living underground under meters of regolith is adequate to filter out all of that excessive radiation. How are we going to make food made for space that has that long shelf life as well as has, overcomes the problems of being savory and textured and nutritious enough, um, but is also um, uh, portable enough? So here's one of the companies I advise. It's called Astrius that is looking at this company of uh, this problem of making long duration nutrition for austere environments. We also need to look at how our medical capabilities uh, are going to change because the nature of the work that we're going to do on the surface of the moon and beyond is going to change. Now we have rugged terrains, the remote or the possibility of trauma and dust. Um, so how do we need to evolve and how do our medical kits need to evolve? And what models do we use to establish permanent off-world medical infrastructure? And how do we go about doing that? Because right now we have on the ISS 40 hours of crew medical training. Um, for the officer, well, is it a physician? Is it an advanced paramedic? Um, and then how do we go about building up those surgical capabilities and those ICU capabilities? And then knowing our design constraints of mass volume power, um, as well as uh, durability and ease of use, how does the, what does the trauma bay of the future on Mars look like? And then how do we go about training the doctors who need to deal with this? Do we need to graduate doctors with a specialty in moon or Mars medicine? And then, of course, this being the era of COVID-19, we can't get away without asking the question, what happens when we encounter the first moondemic? Do we need to look at look, different quarantine protocols? Do we need to suddenly distance ourselves um, for, to 36 feet when we're in one-sixth gravity? We also need to ask the what-if questions. When we deal with cardiac arrest in space, how far do we go? So there's actually, um, this is an official position paper on CPR in space from the European Society of Aerospace Medicine. Um, and it looks at the best research on performing CPR in space with the caveat saying, ultimately, even if you get return of a pulse, but you have no ICU, well, what did you do that all for? So there's a lot of ethical questions that need to be delineated as well. And of course, if we're serious about talking about permanent off-world settle, uh, settlements on the super surface of the moon and beyond, we can't get away without talking about these space birds and the space bees. And so what we're intent on becoming a multi-permanent, uh, multi-planetary bearing species, how do we give birth in altered gravity environments? What does development and uh, gestation and copulation look like? Question mark followed by five more question marks because we have data from insects and jellyfish and fish and mammals. But the best the data say that a, any data we have is conflicting. And then if we're serious about maintaining the standard of care on Mars and, as, and keeping the same standard as we would on Earth, how does that regulation look like? Um, do we have to evolve from having a world health organization to having a galactic health organization? And assuming we solve all of these problems, where do we go to next? So in the last two minutes that remain here to me, let's bring it back closer to home and talk about a few more challenges. So what happens when we democratize access to space? We've so far talked about the value of prevention, sending the healthiest of the healthy to space, but what happens when we let everyone go to space? This isn't a theoretical question because in July of this year, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin sent civilians to space. And if you're a space fan, you know that today, inspiration for the first all civilian crew in history is launching out of Kennedy Space Center. Um, so this is a snapshot of a literature review I uh, recently published with one of my working groups in ACTA Astronautica, looking at the guidelines for commercial space flight and where we go to next. And then the question is, how do we make space more accessible? Um, Stephen Hawking famously flew zero G with a very intensive medical crew in um, parabolic flight on the Vomit Comet in 2007. The European Space Agency made history this year that in their first ever call for para-astronauts, they're looking for astronauts who have disabilities in space um, to be part of the next round of selection. And then let's come back to a final question. I asked you earlier what the International Space Station and a remote village and a polar deployment have in common. These are all examples of extreme and austere and isolated and confined environments. And so hopefully it's come to the forefront of your mind that maybe some of these technological solutions that we have for the most austere environments in space 
will also have benefit for Earth. And here are some examples of spin-offs from space that have benefited Earth directly, whether we're talking in this right or in the top left-hand corner about uh, iodine resin filters to uh, provide clean water on the International Space Station being used for clean water in Kenya, to solar-powered fridges to keep vaccines cool in the lower right-hand corner, um, in the most remote electricity-less uh, places on Earth, to space blankets, which can lock in heat, to handheld ultrasound used in uh, Arctic populations for obstetrical care. So this was a whirlwind tour through the world of space medicine and our upcoming challenges. My hope is that you'll have a better appreciation now of the hazards of the spaceflight environment, the tools available to mitigate these challenges, our design challenges, mass power volume, uh, ease of use, long shelf life, uh, cost efficient, the value of analog environments, the value of emerging technologies and emerging technologies in space medicine. So my takeaway is that you have tools at your disposal, whether it's prevention, computer modeling, interdisciplinary collaboration and emerging technologies. We have good test beds in the form of in uh, analog environments. Uh, constraints can be incre uh, incredible design drivers, as well as the need for risk mitigation, durability, simplicity. Um, and then ask those what if questions. Think ahead of the game. Ask what's next and how do I design for that? So we covered a lot, but I'm happy to take your questions now. All of these solutions that we propose start with a single step. So thank you so much. Wow, that was fantastic. I'm clapping for everybody. <laughs> I'm both terrified and excited and <laughs> I'm sure everyone is. So um, thank you so much, Shauna. I'm sure there's tons of questions we have.